Hey everybody, it's Chris. Welcome to another Chris Beat Cancer interview. Today I am talking to Dr. Sung Wan. Dr. Wan is a medical doctor. He's also an orthopedic surgeon. He's also an advocate advocate for plant-based nutrition and an expert in stem cell therapy. And uh, I'm really excited to dig in with Dr. Wan to share his story, for him to share his expertise with you on plant-based nutrition and how he came to become a uh, an advocate for plant-based eating and also there's a lot to learn about stem cell therapy i'm personally fascinated by stem cell therapy and so i have no idea what he's gonna say about it and i can't wait to hear so dr juan thanks for taking the time to do this well thank you uh so much for having me it's truly an honor well that's that's great i um you know i think a lot of people I'm I'm routinely accused of being anti-doctor or anti-medicine and uh, could not be further from the truth. And my favorite doctors are doctors who take a holistic approach, who, uh, you know, have had the, the light bulb or the wake up call and realized, you know, conventional medical training has has a limited amount of benefits. But there's more. There's more that a patient can do. There's more than a, that a doctor or practitioner can help a patient do to recover from chronic disease or illness or whatever. So uh, kudos to you because you're you're one of the heroes on the front lines helping people every day. And I'm really excited about the 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 oncoming wave or movement of um, holistic medicine, holistic medical uh, approaches to to patient care. So can we start with your story? Because I'd love to know how you evolved in your thinking and the way you treat patients. Sure, absolutely. Uh, you know, I went to, uh, you know, when I went to medical school, uh, one of the things I was very interested in uh, was, you know, either cardiovascular surgery or orthopedic and spine surgery. But I really went into the medicine because my father had multiple back surgeries and he had chronic pain for over 30, 40 years. And I watched him suffer uh, so much from pain and the physicians not being able to, to help them, I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to become a surgeon myself and then help my father. That was my initial motivation. But once I went into medical school, what I realized was that medicine, it was mostly managing the disease, not really fixing the disease. And that's why you know, I was interested in a, a lot of disease process, but wasn't interested in pursuing internal medicine because I felt like they were just putting a Band-Aid on and not really finding the cure for the disease. And, and that's why I, I chose to go into the orthopedic surgery because if you break a bone, there's really not much holistic thing that you can do. You have to do the surgery. What I liked it was you actually go in, you fix the problem, and you came out. You essentially help patient become, cure the disease, right? Which in this sense is either fracture or dislocations or many other the typical orthopedic problems. And that's how, how I went into the orthopedic surgery and, and spine surgery. But while uh, practicing medicine, I also wanted to uh, improve the way we were doing the spine surgery. Because the tip, traditionally, it was a big open back surgery. People bled a lot. There's a lot of scar tissues. So I worked on a lot of minimally invasive uh, surgical techniques. However, at the same time, uh, well, minimally invasive surgery, you're not really exposing the back. We're using the x-ray machine in order to see through the skins and muscle in order to perform the surgery. So great for the patient, but the downside was that as a, a physician and surgeon, we got exposed to a lot of radiation. And of course, uh, you know, we protected ourselves with the lead jacket and lead skirt. However, when you're exposed to it so much, and then also, especially 15 years ago, when we were developing the techniques, uh, we got tremendous amount of exposure. So I used to jokingly say, you know what, you know, in the future, I'll probably get some form of cancer. And I said it jokingly, but one of my closest friends was an anesthesiologist who used to cover my case. At a very, uh, he appeared to be very healthy, but at such a young age, uh, he died from cancer. Mm. And, How old uh, is he? Forties. He, he was around mid forties, and and he had a lung cancer. He never smoked in his life, and um, and it's such a tragic, and it really hit me home. So I went into, uh, yeah, I dove into researching, okay, how do I uh, prevent, you know, cancer and then also reverse cancer? Uh, because although jokingly, I used to tell people I'll probably die from cancer with so much radiation exposure, 
who wants to die from cancer? And once I start diving in, I really realized what I learned in medical school was truly just managing the disease, not really fixing or curing the disease. There's so many things that you could do to actually prevent cancer and then help people reverse cancer without using traditional medicine, but things that we can do every single day holistically to really prevent it. And cancer doesn't happen overnight. It brews for many, many years, right? But everything that we do each day really matters, whether it's from the, the nutrition, whether exercise, sleep, mostly from the lifestyle. But doctors are not really educated on how to prevent cancer. They know how to give a chemotherapy, that's it. And if you ask most of the oncologists, uh, cancer doctors, they don't really know much about nutrition. They don't know how to prevent it, and they don't know how to really optimize the patient's condition in order for them to fight against cancer. And that was really frustrating, and I kept on you know, reading multiple you know, scientific journals, and the answer was there. It's been there for many, many years. We just haven't taken the time to learn because most doctors or the hospitals are not incentivized to really help patients prevent and reverse the disease. I think a lot of my audience understands what you said and, and the reasons why doctors are not incentivized. But would you mind explaining it for someone who maybe uh, has never heard this before, has never really thought about why doctors wouldn't be trained in nutrition, why nutrition wouldn't be a part of medicine? Yeah, I think the, uh, the, the most of it, um, I think medical school has been really funded by a lot of the pharmaceutical companies. And then also doctors are, uh, uh, you know, all the medical school curriculums are about managing the disease. Uh, and also doctors really don't have time to spend the time with patients to teach them about nutrition. They, have, you know, primary care doctors, they have a very difficult job. They, they have to, in, in an hour, see about 30 patients. They can only spend about five minutes with the patient. So what they do is when the patients come in, they already have the biometrics. They see the you know, high blood pressure. They may have certain conditions. And then they just write a prescription. It's almost the patients expect the prescription. And then doctors, that's how they can basically treat the patients really quickly and then have them leave. Then you really don't have time and, you know, to uh, focus on how to uh, cure the disease because that takes a lot of time. And then also, it seemed like from the, the oncologists, most of their revenue really comes from also providing the chemotherapy, right? They're able to provide that in the office, and then that becomes a huge revenue source. But in Texas, the, the largest oncology group is Texas Oncology. Well, guess who owns Texas Oncology? It's actually owned by uh, uh, McKesson. It's a medical device med and, and uh, medicine distribution company. It's not owned by physicians. Right? And so what incentive do they have? And, and medicine has a lot of times become just a money-making machine. And whether it is from the pharmaceutical company, whether it is from the, the hospital. And so anyone who tries to make a wave, you basically put a big target on your back and they'll come after you for just about anything. If a hospital is serving cancer-causing processed meat in their cafeteria, what is their mission? Right? And I've gotten a lot of trouble from the hospitals because I used to post things like, you know, bacon and egg at the hospital cafeteria and put it in the social media. And I used to get called into the, you know, principal's office, CEO <laughs> of hospitals in, in Dallas, Fort Worth area, because they said it makes them look bad. Well, then why are you serving disease causing food in your own hospital where people should be coming there to be healed rather than you are actually creating additional disease. So you could say that uh, I wasn't you know, very well liked that, you know, by the, some of the hospital administrators. I, it makes me love you even more. That's, you're, you're definitely speaking my language. And I don't know how familiar you are with my story, but the very first meal they served me after cutting out a third of my colon was a sloppy joe, you know, which is like the lowest quality ground beef, maybe, it could have been cat meat for all I know, but the lowest quality ground beef, you you know, you can get in this, you know, sloppy sauce on a burger bun. And I, I didn't know anything about nutrition at the time, but even then I was shocked that like, really, this is, this is what you're feeding me right now? 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it it is true, and it it's um, it's uh, cancer is a trillion dollar industry, and they're making a lot of money, trillions, uh, treating a disease, and it really doesn't matter if anyone's cured because they're making tons of money anyway, right? And so, um, unfortunately, that's that's uh, you know that's just the sad reality of, of the business. I think there's a lot of good people in there that really are. This is the way I describe oncologists. I feel like most oncologists are good people that are really that are trapped in a system that pays them really well, despite the results, and they're and they're hoping that the next cancer cure drug will be the one. Right, the next drug will actually, like sometime in their lifetime, a, a drug will come along that actually cures the disease for, for everybody, right, or whatever. Um, and in the meantime, you know, they're just doing the best they can with this limited amount of tools that they've been given and the training they've been given. Um, and so, you know, what what I encourage people to do, patients to do, is, hey, work with the doctor, but. If you want to do treatment, do treatment, but there's so much more you can do at home to help yourself survive. There's so much more that you can do to increase your odds of survival so uh, or decrease your odds of ever getting cancer. And so I'd love to talk to you about, I know you work this way with your patients, even though you're not a cancer doctor, but you have incorporated uh, plant-based nutrition uh, into your practice but actually, before you talk about your sort of your patient relationship and how you navigate that, how did you discover plant-based nutrition? Yeah, so when I was researching how to, to prevent uh, cancer for myself, and then, well, we all have cancer cells in our body, right? Whether you're clinically uh, diagnosed or not, everyone has cancer cells. Our immune system is fighting it every day. And as I was doing research, I came across, uh, you know, Dr. Campbell's book, the, you know, the China study, and then I start, uh, you know, dwelling into all the, the research papers on the how to really prevent uh, and reverse disease as well as a cancer. And I read like thousands of papers because I really thought it was a big scare. Uh, it was a significant loss to me and my, my friends, family members, but then also at the same time, uh, if a healthy individual like that overnight could develop cancer and then be gone within a year, what's going to happen to me? You know, and the doctors have the, the worst lifestyle, right? They're overworked, they're overstressed, they don't sleep, their diet's really poor. And on top of that, you know, getting significant amount of radiation exposures. And I've also heard about some of the other spine surgeons, uh, especially the, the older generations, because they didn't quite understand the radiation. Many of them have passed away from the thyroid cancer, Ewing sarcoma, and many different kinds of cancer. So once and when I started diving into it, I realized that the, the whole food plant-based nutrition is one of the best way to, to prevent um, and even help uh, reverse uh, uh, and treat uh, the cancer. But it's not just the nutrition which plays a huge part, but also significantly that the lifestyle matters also. So, you know, I start uh, living by those principles to, to help me prevent clinically significant cancer because I, I like to tell everybody that everyone has cancer. So don't think that one day all of a sudden magically you're going to get cancer. Cancer cells brewing inside you. That is a normal physiology. However, you got to make sure that you optimize your body, boost your immune system so that you can fight off the cancer cells every single day. So that's how I came about um, uh, uh, my approach to the whole food plant base. And once I realized it, I couldn't keep it to myself. So we started having uh, free seminars uh, at our clinic uh, for, for patients for the past uh, three years. And we cover topics from you know, cancer to heart disease, diabetes, uh, autoimmune disease, because I really believe that that most of the chronic disease are completely preventable, but people just don't know and they have no knowledge and they're bombarded with such a misinformation from the internet. You know, I call those bro science. And then even from their own doctors, you know, one of my uh, assistants, mother had unfortunately breast cancer and her oncologist told her, make sure before the chemotherapy, you eat plenty of protein to get plenty of energy. That's the, the worst thing that one, can, one could do. And that made me realize that even doctors 
uh, really don't know much about nutrition and how to prevent and reverse disease because we never got educated. I had less than an hour of uh, a training in nutrition in medical school, and that's pretty norm all across the country. What were some of the studies that stood out for you when you were, you know, initially researching? Like, what what were the things that you were that you sort of discovering that were making you think, of, whoa, wait a minute? Yeah, and so you know, I, I read, you know, like Dr. Campbell's book. I mean, that was the initial lightning moment, you know, and and his studies, and and not only in China, but his initial studies in in, in Philippines. And then how it had so much to do with the, the the nutrition and the difference between people from the rural city and then and then from the city um, and poor to rich and, and then their diet. There was something that was definitely there. It's like you know my parents and my uh, mother-in-law tells me where I eat is where they used to eat when they were really poor back when they were in Korea, right? And but if you study even um, you know the blue zones. It's all the people, common people, or you know, lower socioeconomic class of people who are living longer because they can't afford to eat processed food or they can't afford to eat meat, and they're eating the food the way it was naturally grown. They're the one who is living longer than everybody else and disease-free. And so uh, for me, it was the initial lightning moment was you know, uh, reading Dr. Campbell's book, the, the China study, that got me in to start reading the papers that he was citing. Um, and that really got me motivated. That's incredible. I, I love it because um, I say this all the time, which is eat like a poor person. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I, the pauper's diet, right? I should write a book called The Pauper's Diet. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it's true. The, the, the simple, humble foods from the earth that millions and millions of people around the world are eating whole grains, vegetables, fruit when it's in season, of course, beans, rice, potatoes, all the legumes, you know, um, are just wonderful, nourishing, health promoting foods. And um, the rich people, right, Americans, Europeans, uh, and, and, you know, many wealthy people in other countries, uh, are not eating those kind of foods. They got they you know, you've probably seen this study, but there, I mean, there's more than one study. But as a country's economic, um, as a country increases economically, like China, right? The more industry that comes into a country, factories and businesses, the more jobs are created, the more income rises, the more money is spent on animal food. Mm -hmm. It's one of the first things that people spend money on when, when they start to make money is like, let's have some steak, <laughs> right? Yeah. Instead of this, instead of rice every day. You know, um, even in my culture, um, you know, I, I immigrated from uh, Korea back in early 80s. However, one thing I noticed uh, in Korea is not there. Uh, a lot of people are getting type of cancers they never used to have. A lot of Koreans and Japanese never really used to have prostate cancer. Uh, they used to have a lot of soy in their diet. They used to eat a lot of beans, a lot of vegetables. But as the country became wealthier and then and then evolved, they're eating significant amount of uh, meat, uh, animal-based food, and processed food. And these days, when I actually go to a Korean restaurant, it's very difficult for me because everything it has oil, everything is meat-based. Even the soup and stew that used to be based was water or vegetable broth, now is meat-based. So it's very, very difficult. And you can see that. And not only Korean Americans, but uh, in Koreans, the number of cancer is rising rapidly, and including prostate cancer. And then more commonly, they used to have stomach cancer rather than colon cancer, like in the United States. But then now, the, not only the stomach cancer is continuing to rise, even colon cancer, which was relatively rare in Korea, is rising rapidly because their diet has completely changed. And also every Saturday, I actually provide a, 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 a teach the residents and some of the physicians in, in Africa. Just like Dr. Campbell wrote the, the China study, I think he should, next book should be Africa study. And, and I used to lecture a long time ago about how healthy Africans were because they ate the, the, the food that was, you know, grew from the ground and then their tubers look completely different. They ate tremendous amount of fiber However, in the city, it's changing. 
You know, um, even 10 years ago, heart disease wasn't even the top 10 cause of death. It was mostly infection-related disease. And now the, uh, the heart disease is number four. The obesity, diabetes, and cancer incidence is rising rapidly, even in Africa. And so what we're trying to educate the, the physicians there and the residents there. They need to go back to the way it was before and eat like you know they did 20, 30, 40 years ago. Because our body, human body, has evolved for millions of years eating the food that it grew from the ground naturally. It's only been over the past 50 years that we are eating so much more uh, processed food and, and food. That's why our body was naturally designed to be eating like what we are doing right now. That's why autoimmune disease that never used to really exist 50 years ago, it's so common. Cancer rate is rising so rapidly that by 2030, it's going to become the number one killer of Americans in this country outdoing the, the heart disease. That is it's really, truly sad and tragic. It is tragic. And I'm glad you brought up Africa because I'm a big fan of Dr. Dennis Burkett, who is one of the pioneers of uh, epidemiological research among the rural Africans who I talk about him in my book. And, uh, you know, the things that he discovered were, were so um, are, are so important even now that the Africans had virtually no heart disease, virtually very little rates of cancer, no, no colon cancer, no digestive diseases. And they were eating tons of fiber, tons of starchy vegetables, very little to no processed food, and very, very little animal food. And it's this is not complicated. It's not rocket science. It's actually very, very simple. And um, that's that's the truth is simple. Lies are complicated. Yep. And so, uh, so okay, so you're, you're having these light bulbs, you're having these epiphanies, you know, you're probably having some challenges to your convictions and your conscience about, you know, being in the medical industry. And so I'm assuming, um, obviously, that you started to transition and teach your patients how to take care of themselves. And by the way, I should mention you're in Irvine, Texas, Irving, Texas. Irving, Texas, yes. Yeah. So if anybody watching is near Irving, Texas, you can go uh, to one of Dr. Juan's uh, Saturday classes, right? Yes, absolutely. Yep. Everyone's and, and, oh, by that. the way, what's your website? Uh, it's the uh, uh, neogennutrition.com. Um, but also, actually, our stem cell therapy clinic is neogenstemcell.com, N E O. Uh, G E N stem cell dot com. That is the, the website where we announce the, the seminars. And we're also you can find me on Facebook as well as Instagram. And we do uh, monthly seminars locally uh, uh, and give a, a presentation. Also, people can join uh, through the webinar on Saturday. Uh, we do we typically do three different uh, seminars on Saturdays, one to Africa and then one to the um, uh, rest of the America. That's amazing. Before we started the interview, we were chatting about um, the the improvements you saw with patients being a spine surgeon and the the plant based diet helping them recover faster. And you're explaining the mechanism by which this happens. So I'd love for you to talk about you know sp spinal surgery and nutrition and how it all kind of fits together. Yeah. So one of the the very important thing. Uh, with overall health is our vascular system. In order to, to heal, we need to be able to um, deliver the nutrients and oxygen. So our vascular system is critical. That's one thing that's great about plant-based nutrition is able to, to provide us with a really optimal vascular system. Um, because, you know, within our blood vessel, uh, the inner layer is called endothelium, and that's where the nitric oxide gets produced, which I believe is one of the most important molecules in our body. By the time uh, we're age 40, we lose about 50%. By the time we're 60, we lose about 85% of our ability to produce nitric oxide because the endothelium is so damaged due to atherosclerosis. And so uh, by plant-based nutrition, you can elevate the, there's a two different pathway. One is through the artery, the other way it is through the nutrition. And so if it's damaged through nutrition, you can elevate the nitric oxide 
so then they can stimulate the, the stem cells. In order for our body to continue to heal ourselves, we have to reactivate our own stem cells. And if you don't have enough nitric oxide, that nitric oxide is what activates the, the, the stem cells. Without it, you're not able to activate them. That's part of the reason why we continue to age and we can't repair the damaged cells, whether it is a ligament, whether it is a bone, whether it's a heart tissue, any other parts of our body. And so when patients are uh, uh, getting in a lot more uh, plant-based food that tends to heal, the food, can you can look at it as, is that going to help me heal or is that going to damage my body? And so most of the plant-based food is obviously is going to help us heal because it's filled with phytonutrients, polyphenols, and, and, and antioxidants. And so when you are providing your body to, to naturally heal, many of my patients who needed spine surgery was starting to heal themselves. And they were losing the weight, they had difficult time losing. They had, you know, at the same time, their you know, cardiovascular system was being optimized. And then they suffered from severe pain and then those pains were going away. And they would come back uh, to the clinic saying, hey, I lost about 50 pounds and following your nutrition plan and then my pain is gone, so I no longer need your uh, spine service anymore. So in a way, I'm putting myself out of the job as a spine surgeon, right? And I was so excited for them. And, and this one particular lady had a severe herniated disc in her thoracic spine. So only way we could get to her spine was basically doing a thoracotomy, cutting her chest open, deflating her lung in order to gain access to the spine. So I told her, give me three months, just follow my protocol. Uh, all it is is a whole food plant-based nutrition, walk you know, an hour a day, and then come back and see me in three months. If you still are in a lot of pain at that time, we can undergo surgery. That's when she came back and said, you know, I lost about 50 pounds. My husband lost about 70 pounds and I no longer have pain. I don't need your service anymore. So that's so, amazing. I mean, it's it's so fantastic. Uh, and it just gets me excited <laughs> because, um, you know, the body has a remarkable a miraculous ability to heal itself mm -hmm. if given the proper nutrients and care. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what you're guiding your patients to do. And uh, there are many physicians and surgeons who are, are very knife happy, very quick to put people under the knife. And spine surgery is, that's a major surgery, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's a big time. And because still majority of the spine surgery in this country are done open back surgery. These days, if you need, only if you need the surgery and you failed all the, the treatment and there are certain conditions where you do need the surgery, every patient should definitely look for a surgeon who can do it minimally invasively so that you're not flayed open and then have create a lot of bleeding and scar tissue and long-term uh, healing process. But if you do the, feed your body with the right nutrients, majority of the patients will not need surgery. And even you need surgery, you can recover so much faster with, with proper nutrition. And I see most of the people take better care of their car than their own body, right? If you drive an unleaded car, you're not going to put a diesel gas. And everyone knows why, because it's going to break the car. But then most people do know that the food that they eat is bad for them, but they continue to consume it. And then when they get a heart attack or cancer or diabetes, Oh my God, I'm so surprised. Why did I get have to have heart attack? Well, it's because what you've been doing to yourself for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, kids between age 12 to 14 years old, 65% of them have already have early signs of atherosclerosis. So, so what is your vascular system going to look like when you're in your 40s, 50s, and 60s? It is amazing that there, yeah, that atherosclerosis is starting so young, starting basically in children, uh, just from our diet. What's the typical, uh, the typical patient that comes to you with back problems that, that thinks they may need surgery or need surgery, are they typically overweight? Well, many of them, right? And they perfectly fit the, the statistics of uh, a typical Americans because 80% of Americans are either overweight obese or severely obese, right? And which leads to not only the back problem, knee problem, and an extra basically pound uh, in your gut, uh, in your belly area is, is equivalent to seven pounds in your knee. So it puts so much more pressure. 
So wow. the, those individuals with, let's say, knee pain and hip pain and back pain, if they were to lose a good amount of weight, all that pain would be gone, and many of them probably could avoid uh, any kind of surg- surgery or any other invasive procedures. Well, that's really encouraging news, I think, for a lot of people watching or listening who have thought, you know, their back problems, their knee problems, their hip problems were irreversible, right? And the truth is, your body can heal, but you have to make major changes, right? The, the, the pain pills aren't going to heal it, right? And sometimes the surgery doesn't fix it either, right? Not, not at all. You know, even some, you know, they, they've done the study where, you know, they tore their meniscus and they had a meniscectomy. And when they compared that to physical therapy versus surgery, it didn't make any difference, right? Just like the recent paper, even for heart, where whether somebody has a cardiac cath or a open heart surgery, it was no better than being treated with medicine and, and lifestyle was the only thing that actually was able to reverse the disease, not just managing the disease. And so same with the, the, uh, the orthopedics, majority of them, even you have the surgery, if you don't provide your body with the right nutrients to, to heal it, how is it supposed to heal, right? And so their recovery is gonna be so much more difficult, longer, and a surgery that could have been successful may not be. And, but most importantly, many of them probably could have avoided surgery in the first place. It's, yeah, it is amazing that just, just a plant-based diet, some exercise could turn something around so quickly. And you, you typically tell your patients to, to do that for three months? Yeah, I, I, everyone, when they come in, that's one of the first things that I talk about. Because in order to reduce the pain, you have to decrease the inflammation in your system. You know, uh, as, uh, patients have to fill out... You know, they think it's weird. You're coming to an orthopedic surgeon or spine surgeon's office, and then there's a questionnaire about what do you have for breakfast, what do you have for lunch, and what do you have for dinner? And most people are eating inflammatory food every single day and, uh, you know, significant amount of saturated fat. Three disease. times a day, right? Yeah, three times a day, four times a day. And, and so no wonder they're having so much pain. And I said, there's a way you can help and, and, and only you can actually heal the body. I can only provide the information to you and you have a complete control. And so, so then uh, I provide them with the, the nutrition plan and some of them thinks that I'm cuckoo and, and said, how's uh, eating better supposed to help with my back? Well, you know, you are uh, you know, significantly overweight and, but we can work on that. And then you are eating food that you know, causes a lot of inflammation by decreasing the inflammation with a nutrition and proper therapy and exercise, we should be able to really ease the pain and get you better. And some people buy into it, and some people there's a, a you know several patients basically kind of walked out saying that I'm a crazy surgeon and for recommending nutrition for for their back problems or their knee problems. You know we have all different kinds, but the ones who have majority of the ones. Uh, who really uh, comply with our uh, nutrition plan? He been able to, he been able to avoid big surgeries. That's fantastic. I love that. So I'd love to ask you also about stem cells and stem cell therapy because I know you're an expert in this, uh, and would love for you to to educate me and and my audience on uh, the role of stem cells in healing, the value of, of this therapy, what what you've seen it help, what maybe it doesn't make any difference for? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, one thing I, I like to uh, tell uh, uh, patients and everyone in general, when it comes to stem cell, be cautious, uh, be skeptical, because there are a tremendous amount of advertising and marketing that's uh, done out in the community. Uh, stem cell therapies are being done by, you know, chiropractors, nurse practitioners, people who are not a scientist because it became a buzzword, right? Right now, only uh, clinically uh, evidence uh, uh, stem cell therapy is really orthopedic related. It can't cure autism. It can't cure Alzheimer's. It can't cure, you know, uh, cancers. What is available within the, uh, the clinical uh, setting? Um, so I want everyone to know that be cautious if somebody is making over claims beyond orthopedics that it's, it's basically it's a fraud. Okay. And so what we're doing is we are uh, in the orthopedic sense when somebody has arthritis 
or somebody has torn their ligaments or their tendons, what we're doing is we're harvesting their own uh, stem cells from their bone marrow. Just like if, let's say somebody has leukemia and then they basically kill up all their stem cells and then they get the, the stem cell transplant from uh, a donor. It's a similar concept. Uh, we typically harvest the, the, uh, the bone marrow from their ileum and it's a minor procedure, but it's definitely a procedure and, they, and they're pretty sore. It can be done under local or little light sedation, uh, um, but it's a relatively uh, short procedure. Once that's done, then, then we concentrate the specific type of cells, what we call mesenchymal cells, cells that has a potential to turn into other cells. But mostly what we're understanding is that they actually have a, something called paracrine effect. What they're doing is they're sending out the message within that environment. They recognize, hey, this area is inflamed, this area is damaged. So then it sends out the signal so then other stem cells in that region can come and then uh, uh, redevelop into a specific type of cells so that it assists healing the tendons, ligaments, or cartilages. It doesn't completely replace it. And I'm sure in future, maybe 10, 20 years from now, uh, the technology will evolve even further, but right now the extent of the, the stem cell is to, to assist your body heal faster. And, and, and in order to do so, also, it's not just the stem cells. And what we specifically counsel our patient is that you also have to provide your stem cells right type of nutrients so that it can develop into a different types of cells. It can do its job by sending out the proper signals. And in order to, again, as I mentioned before, to activate the stem cells, you really need to boost the, the nitric oxide in your system, which is one of the, the key molecules that have shown is critical in order to activate them. And the only way most people are going to be able to elevate and boost their nitric oxide is through the nutrition. That means you got to eat the food that contains a lot of nitrates, which is in a dark green leafy vegetables like kale, spinach, arugula, bok choy, broccoli, you know, collard greens those type of food uh, six times a day to really boost it. Um, and then also they have to have a proper you know, microbiome in their mouth. And so we definitely advise people uh, not utilizing antiseptic mouthwash. Most people don't realize mouthwash has association with the cardiovascular disease is because you're not only killing bad bacteria, but you're also killing good bacteria that helps you reduce the nitrate into nitric oxide. Same goes with somebody, a lot of people these days, especially among a lot of meat eaters, they get uh, acid reflux, right? And I used to have a bad acid reflux, and within a month of going whole food plant-based, acid reflux is, was gone. I was on two different kinds of medications. I had difficult times sleeping at night because of the acid reflux. Sometimes I would have to stop uh, doing surgery because I thought I was having a chest pain, um, but it was really the acid reflux. But when the and then most people are taking proton pump inhibitors like Nexium and Prilosec, reducing the acid that limits your ability to produce nitric oxide in your system. That's why the the acid reducers also have association with cardiovascular disease because it limits your ability to produce nitric oxide. So you know for uh, uh, cardiovascular uh, patients, I definitely ask them to stop using uh, antiseptic mouthwash stop using uh, acid reducers, and they say, well, I, uh, then what do I do? Well, stop eating the things that is actually causing the acid reflux to begin with. And, um, and so nitric oxide becomes one of the uh, uh, most important molecule for, uh, for stem cell therapy. Is there an association or accreditation certification of some kind that uh, patients should look for when they're looking for stem cell therapy? Yeah, I think they should definitely, number one, be treated by a, a physician who's definitely trained as for their certificates. Uh, are they you know, MD or DO, right? Um, and at least in Dallas, there's a tremendous amount of uh, uh, so-called stem cell therapy, which I do not believe they, they you know, get the materials from uh, amniotic tissues. Uh, and then they call it stem cell. FDA states that it is not a stem cell. Only uh, F you don't have to be FDA approved, but FDA recognized that the bone marrow derived uh, tissues are considered the stem cell therapy. 
Um, but there, uh, these type of treatments are being done at the chiropractor's office. It's being done at med spas. So people have to just think, do you really think that something that is complicated as a stem cell therapy can be done at med spa settings or at the chiropractor's office? I'm a believer in chiropractor and the, the things they, they do as long as it's done properly. So I'm not knocking on chiropractors or any other healthcare providers. I just have a problem with people going beyond their training level and then providing the services to people that that really should not be doing. And that's where I have a problem, uh, uh, and especially uh, in that type of setting. So people just need to use their head and, and, and think about it. Should I be getting stem cell therapy at a strip mall at, at a med spa? <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I'm so glad you you've you said that because... I definitely have seen a fair share of, of sketchy stem cell therapy type, you know, adverts and uh, things like that that just made me like, you know, feel a little uneasy. I've never had it done. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've definitely heard some uh, some anecdotal, you know, testimonials of people that helped with their knee or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, that's that seems really important. Obviously, work with a physician, a medical doctor who's trained in it. it uh, is there a particular association of physicians, you know, stem cell therapy physicians? Yeah, so there's uh, several different type of association. Uh, there's an interventional orthopedic uh, society. So if you're having orthopedic uh, uh, stem cell therapy, ask if they have any association with them. And there's also a national uh, a stem, you know, the Regenerative Medicine Society also. So ask those specific physicians what society they belong to. One's not necessarily better than the others, but uh, you know, make sure that they're continuing to get the, the education and doing the research to provide the, the most up-to-date, proper stem cell therapy. Also, if somebody is really pushing you to do amniotic tissue therapy, or uh, um, you know umbilical cord, and they call that a stem cell. I mean, those do have an effect, but they're more of a growth factors. They're not stem cell, but majority of them are marketing as a stem cell therapy. And if they mention something like that, and if they cannot harvest the bone marrow, it's ultimately patient's choice what treatment they select. But if that physicians cannot do bone marrow harvesting and then provide that type of mesenchymal stem cell therapy in their office, then you probably shouldn't have the treatment at that office. What do you see in terms of the future of stem cell therapy? I know you said there's, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of research for orthopedics, and, but there's also a lot of claims about uh, other types of treatments that are not really substantiated yet in the literature. But I'm sure you're hearing things all the time. Like, where do you think this is going? Yeah, I think more will be coming uh, in the future. I, I still think we're about 10, 20 years away. Um, you know, I, I, I see a lot of people traveling to different parts of the world to get the stem cell therapy. And then right now, what's big fad is that getting a, a treatment in, into their IV. What people don't realize is 98% of them cut in their lungs, so it never goes to the rest of the body. And that's why you know that that uh, um, most of it is a scam it, and it does not pass blood brain barrier so those cells cannot get to the brain and then how are you supposed to treat the Alzheimer's disease with those type of stem cells they're selling false promises however a lot of uh, research is being done I think you know uh, I think maybe in 10 20 years rather than stem cell therapy I think a lot of it is going to be genetic therapy I think which has a lot more a uh, promise but you can put them all in the similar category of a regenerative medicine. So less and less it's about stem cell therapy, it's becoming more of different means of providing regenerative therapy. But also, you know, I uh, want people to realize uh, uh, that nutrition also plays a significant role because we now understand there's something called epigenetics, right? And so by doing, you know, having proper lifestyle and nutrition, you know, we can turn on and off the genes and we have the ability to control it, not just for ourselves, but also for our offspring and then their offspring. So don't want people to, to forget about it. And if you're getting stem cell therapy, that's only half the game. Just like I tell people, if they have surgery, it's only half the game. It's what you do with it afterwards through nutrition and rehab that will definitely make it, 
make you better so much uh, so much better yeah it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to to fix something or regenerate it if you're going to continue to damage it if you yeah continue. absolutely yeah and it's what people are doing every single day and even you don't do it because uh, you know we breathe oxygen and then we go outside uh, even when we eat we are essentially damaging our body because we're constantly bombarded with oxidative stress and that's why we have to make a great deal of effort to to fuel our body so that it could heal itself what do you think about, um, I want to ask you just a couple of quick questions, uh, sort of some fun ones, actually. Um, what's your what's your ideal breakfast, lunch, and dinner? So if, if someone told you, you can only eat the same three meals every day for the rest of your life, right? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What would that look like? Yeah, so, you know, I have a pretty uh, you know, typical uh, uh, routine. You know, first thing I do wake up in the morning is I... You know, get a large glass of water, like apple cider vinegar or different forms of uh, vinegar. And then I have uh, a very large bowl of steel-cut oatmeal. That's one of my favorite breakfasts, but it's actually what you add to it. And so so then I actually also add um, spinach, kale, and Swiss chard on it. Most people think it's we're adding green. I look for every opportunity to add greens to, to my diet. And then I put turmeric, a ginger, amla, which is an Indian gooseberry powder, hemp seed, flax seed, chia seeds. And then I love spice, so I add cayenne pepper and chili pepper. That is what my typical uh, oatmeal looks like, along with bananas and then blueberries. And I also consume a lot of, whether blueberries, strawberries, or uh, raspberries, or you know blackberries uh, throughout the day. And so that is my uh, go-to uh, breakfast. And then my snack is I um, each day I make about 60 ounces of uh, uh, a smoothie. Um, and, you know, um, I call it super smoothie. It has about you know 18 to 20 different ingredients in it. And then also there are type of uh, ingredients that is going to help me fight the cancer cells because that's how I really started this uh, uh, this journey. And so um, it has about 18 different ingredients, and I drink that throughout the day. And so a lot of my diet is mostly raw. I love cooked food, so you know I do definitely uh, eat them. But it, uh, I try to consume at least 30 to 40 ounces of my uh, smoothies um, uh, every single day. Well, uh, and what's the, some of the ingredients in the smoothie? Oh, so, so definitely uh, the key ingredients is the greens. And then so you need to have the cruciferous vegetables. I want to take advantage of the, the sulforaphane. So it has the, uh, the I, I, I make broccoli sprouts. I teach people how to make broccoli sprouts because it has the, one of the highest contents of the, the sulforaphane. It has kale, spinach, uh, sweet chard, and arugula. Um, and, and that's a majority of my uh, the container. I have about 60 ounce uh, a Vitamix container. Fill it up all the way to the top, and then I squeeze it down. Then I add flax seeds, chia seed, and hemp seeds uh, for my, and walnuts for my uh, healthy uh, omega threes. And then I add the, the spices of turmeric, uh, ginger, and then the, um, the black pepper and cinnamon. Um, and then, of course, then I add the, the berries, uh, mostly blueberries, but uh, sometimes blackberries and strawberries. Um, and all these foods that I mentioned are have the anti-cancer uh, uh, properties. And then also, you know, sometimes I use water or sometimes I use uh, uh, soy milk. And then the soy milk that I get has only two ingredients, which is soy and water. And so I don't get the, the soy milk that is a, mostly seen at the grocery store it has about 10 different ingredients. And I tried anything that comes in a box. I want to make sure it really minimizes the, the ingredients. And so my soy milk has only two ingredients. And then, the, um, then also I add different, you know, uh, the vegetables like uh, tomatoes. Uh, it's better cooked because it, the lycopene is more bioavailable. But uh, for smoothie, uh, it's raw. I add, you know, celery and carrot. And then after that, then it's for taste. Uh, so, so I may add additional uh, mango or bananas. Uh, uh, apple, pineapple, um, and then uh, cacao powder. Uh, so that, a lot of ingredients. That is uh, a super smoothie. That sounds amazing. I love yeah. it. And uh, and tastes great, but not only that, that I know that it's not only um, has a lot of anti-cancer properties, but it also allows me to heal my gut, right? Because uh, the gut microbiome is another essential 
uh, um, uh, element to, to achieving the, the optimal health, to help you decrease inflammation, and then to provide your body with a lot of chemicals that's going to, to help you heal. And so that's one of the first things that I really recommend to, to everyone because people say, I have difficult time eating so much greens. I can't eat salad all day long. I say, well, have it as a snack, but uh, make yourself a large smoothie and then just sip it throughout the day. So that, that's then, great advice. And, and um, it's, I'm glad you brought up the gut, gut health because, um, you know, probiotics are, are all the rage. There's a, a thousands of probiotic brands and companies selling probiotics. And, um, you know, one of the best sources of probiotics in, in terms of uh, diverse probiotics is raw fruits and vegetables. Yes. And, you know, your smoothie and, you know, I had giant salads every day when I was trying to heal cancer and giant smoothies full of fruits and vegetables. You you won't get a more diverse array of bacteria from raw produce. And yeah. so and you don't have to buy a supplement. Uh, absolutely, because I think most of the, the probiotics that's out in the market is significantly underdosed. It doesn't really work. Uh, and, and I think people are wasting their money. Most importantly, you can get the probiotics from, like you said, the raw, uh, you know, fruits, vegetables. But also, you have to feed the microbiome. You, if you want to make them happy, just like if you're hungry, you're not happy. Microbiomes, if they're hungry, they're not going to be happy, right? So you have to feed them. Fiber is really not for you, right? Fiber is really for the the microbiomes that that are in your gut. And so prebiotics, which are the fibers, is what you need to, to, uh, to feed, feed them with. And uh, average Americans consume about 10 to 15 grams of fiber per day. And what I typically recommend to my patients is that you need to try to hit at least 70 grams of fiber per day. And my goal for myself, which is difficult to do these with the modern food, uh, even their whole food, is that hitting that 100 grams of fiber per day, that is my goal. Um, whether I hit it or not, but at least I have to have a goal. And then, the, as you mentioned, the, the you know the African nations, many of them and the ones who consume between 100 to 150 grams of fiber, those are the ones who didn't have heart, heart disease. They, those are the ones who didn't have uh, cancer. They are the ones who didn't have obesity or diabetes. So fiber is one of the uh, the key uh, uh, ingredients that we need to be consuming uh, every day that provides all the healthy probiotics as well as a prebiotics. I'm a big fan of fiber as well. And uh, I, yeah, I, I typically get around 70 grams a day, some days less if I if I only eat two meals, right. But mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that's same same target for me. Um, as well, fiber and starch feed the feed the good bacteria. And yeah. so you get two sort of two things in one with plant food, you get lots of raw fruits and vegetables it gives you uh, a diversity of bacteria. And then the fiber in fruits and vegetables and cooked uh, vegetables feeds that good bacteria and helps it to thrive and populate and crowd out the bad bacteria. And I'll say one other thing that, you know, there's there's been several studies and I imagine there will be more emerging uh, where they found that probiotic supplements actually had the reverse effect. They had the opposite effect that they were intended to have, which is they would put patients on probiotics and they found that um, there's one particular study where they put patients on antibiotics, which, you know, kind of wipes out your gut bacteria. And then they put, took half of them and they gave them a probiotic and the other half, they didn't give them anything. And um, I don't want to misquote the study, but the gist of it was, is that the patients who uh, didn't eat anything restored their gut bacteria in about a month or two. Mm -hmm. And the patients who took the probi probiotics, it took them way longer. I think it was four to six months. Oh, to wow. restore their gut bacteria. And the reason is, is the probiotics they took uh, crowded out yeah. uh, and prevented a, a more diverse population of bacteria to thrive in their gut. So anyway, just more, um, you know, I know there's folks out listening right now that are like, whoa, I've never heard of this. This is kind of crazy. I'll put links below the interview to those studies so um, so you everyone can click through and, and learn some things. Um, but that really changed my opinion on probiotics. I you know, and just, I went from being neutral on mm -hmm. probiotics to being like, oh, wait a minute, they could actually cause you some problems. Yeah. I mean, just about any kind of supplements can potentially cause problems. And so I think most people are reductionists and they, everyone's looking for that magic pill. 
And people forget that supplements are only supposed to supplement. They're not supposed, they're not replacement, right? And, and they really need to do the right thing and then feed them uh, their body what they really need before they're trying to look for some magic pill that doesn't really exist. I think supplements without changing your diet are largely a complete waste of money. Uh, the benefit will be minimal to none, <laughs> you know, but if you radically change your diet and then you add some, some key supplementation that you're not getting in your diet, uh, like vitamin D, for example, yep. uh, that actually can be helpful for anybody, even with a bad diet. But, um, but yeah, then, then you're, you're adding more fuel to the fire and you're, uh, it's, uh, li the likelihood that they'll help you is greater. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I appreciate that. I really appreciate your perspective. I'm just so thankful to connect with you. I'm thankful for um, the the wonderful work that you're doing. Um, like I said in the beginning of the interview, like, it's so great to to have holistic minded, uh, nutrition focused medical doctors like, working with patients one on one. And you know, look, I get it. Like you, you're encouraging patients to do things that make you less money. And and because of you have a core conviction that you want to actually see them recover versus just make as much money as fast as possible. Right. And retire. Yeah. And that's so wonderful. It's so admirable. And um, I know you're a you're a shining example to a lot of medical doctors. And I hope, you know, I have a fair amount of medical doctors that, that watch my interviews and listen to podcasts. And I hope they're inspired by you and reach out and connect with you as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I hope it was helpful for uh, many patients or listeners and even some of the other doctors um, because I think most doctors have really good intention um, and they go into medicine to, to help people and to, to heal people uh, because it is a very difficult process. If you just want to make money, there's so much easier way to make money than being a doctor these days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and many doctors are really, you know, dissatisfied and unhappy because they had the right intention when they went in, but they're caught in the system, right? They work for big hospitals. Most independent physicians these days, they can't keep the door open because they are run over by the, the, the physician's group that's owned by the major hospital systems or insurance companies are now owning the you know, medical groups uh, or medical distribution companies. And so, and then they're caught up in all the EMRs and bureaucracies. And so, but most of them have a great intention. And our mission is also to, to help them and then to unload some of them. And then we ask them to, hey, if, if your patients are interested, have them come attend our free seminars. And then, you know, we also help people, you know, find uh, sources like, like your organization, uh, especially people with uh, a cancer or somebody with diabetes, because I'm only an orthopedic surgeon, right? I, I know just enough to, to help guide them to the proper sources. And, but, uh, you know, uh, we love being that uh, resource for, for the patients because, you know, I, I grew up most of my life when I was young with my father being a patient himself. And I know what it's like. And, um, and you are, you know, those, we want to be able to help those people who want to help themselves. That's really what it boils down to. Some people don't want to change and can't be helped, but the ones that are willing to change are, are, are tr a tremendous joy and uh, give you so much fulfillment to work with them and to see them transform their life and their health and get their, you know, enthusiasm and their joy back and their vigor and like all those wonderful things, get their life back. Um, I know how debilitating uh, chronic disease can be. And uh, yeah, we've, we've both got a big heart to help people. And so... I appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Juan. This was absolutely fun, fantastic, and uh, I'm so glad we did it. Uh, everybody, I'll put links to connect with Dr. Juan below this interview. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can click the show notes. If you're watching on Crispy Cancer, it'll be just below the video. Uh, if you're listening to the podcast, click the show notes. But um, we'll put links to the resources mentioned um, and uh, links to Dr. Juan and some of the studies I talked about and, um, and a few other articles that will be uh, interesting. I think w one other thing I wanted to mention that you reminded me of was uh, two, two resources uh, for practitioners and doctors. One is uh, the Plantrition 
uh, organization, which is an organization of plant-based medical doctors. And you'd be surprised how many there are. Uh, it's growing probably every day. It's pretty fascinating. But I did an interview with the director and, and founder, uh, Dr. Scott Stoll. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll link to that. And then also I interviewed um, Dr. Pamela Weibel. Do you know Pamela? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she, yeah, yeah. She's an amazing, again, another plant-based medical doctor. But her, her big mission is to uh, help prevent uh, physician suicide, yes. doctor suicide. And she has a doctor suicide hotline. Um, and you mentioned, you, you alluded to this, but it is very difficult to be a physician. There's so much pressure. It's very hard to make a living. I mean, they're burning the candle at both ends, many, many physicians. And, you know, seeing 30 patients an hour, that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it just, and it just, I think so many physicians are just from talking with learning from Pamela and interviewing her. I mean, so many are, are depressed and discouraged and disillusioned, uh, you know, and and the the real life experience of practicing medicine is nothing like what they imagined when they signed up for med school and uh and then yeah there's there's a lot of uh, you know a lot of them feel trapped and hopeless and take their lives and it actually the highest rate of suicide is the medic in the medical profession yeah and so anyway that those are two resources i'll link to in the show notes for anybody listening um because all this is related obviously but Anyway, uh, thanks again, Dr. Juan. This is awesome. Thanks for listening, everyone. Please share this video with people you care about. Help us spread the message that the body can heal if given the proper nutrients and care and that plant food is wonderful and amazing and can help you reverse chronic disease and prevent chronic disease. And uh, we'll live to fight another day. <laughs> Well, thank you again for having me on. It was it was great. Uh, it was so much fun, and hopefully it was helpful. And and for most Definitely. people, you know, I'm pretty active on social media. If they want to reach out, uh, I answer them all myself. It's not you know some uh, assistant who answers my you know uh, social media. And a lot of people do reach out if they have questions, and I'd be happy to help and do anything I can to help people. That's fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Juan. Okay, everybody, have a great day. See you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.